And what they decided they would do, the, the authorities, was that I would carry both heads as hand luggage. And to conceal it, the heads were placed each in sealed white plastic buckets. And then each bucket placed in a very expensive designer Italian firm carrier bag. What typically does a forensic anthropologist do? Our job, the forensic bit, um, comes from the Latin forensis, meaning pertaining to the forum. And of course, the forum were the open courts of Rome. So anything that has the word forensic in front of it means that its prime purpose is to assist the courts. And the anthropology is the Greek bit, which means the study of man. So it's the study of the human for the court's purposes. In reality, what it means is that most forensic anthropology is about identification. When you have human remains, if when you have, whether it's bodies or skeletons, being able to get back to the name of the person is the most important thing, first of all, for an investigation, because it's really difficult if you have a body and you don't know who it is to try to figure out what's happened to them because you can't talk to their family or their friends or their colleagues. And once we do get that identification, it's so important, it's right, because then that body is released back to a family. And so we have to be sure that we release the right person back. So ours is all about identity, whereas a forensic pathologist will more often be focused on the cause of death and the manner of death. We're really interested in who was the person when they were alive. Which is, I guess, what you did when you went to Kosovo, for example, that was exhuming many, many bodies. What was what was that about? That was, I mean, it was one of those pivotal moments in both my career and personally, where it just had so much impact and will never, never leave me. And it's something that I'm very grateful for having mm. experienced, but my goodness me, was it a sobering experience. And, you know, like everybody else, I watched what was going on in the Balkan region um, towards the end of the 1990s uh, with mm. horror and didn't expect that I would actually go out there. But I got a phone call one Wednesday afternoon from Peter Vanessa, who was a pathologist who was out there. And Peter had said to me, what are you doing on Saturday, Suze? And I thought, oh, that's nice. He's, he's asking me for dinner. And he wasn't. <laughs> he was saying, that's great. I've got was tickets for you. You're flying. No. Um, oh. He's a pathologist. Um, oh. <laughs> and he said, you're flying out to Kosovo. And so I didn't really know what I was going out there to do. And um, when I arrived, we, we flew into Skopje, obviously, because you couldn't fly into Kosovo. And once we got to the scene, it was something that I'd never experienced before. We had 43 men um, who'd been herded into an outhouse and they had been shot with Kalashnikov fire, so the room had just been sprayed oh. with fire. They had stood at the window and thrown in straw and thrown in petrol and torched the building. And so we, we came along probably about nine months later. And so mm. what we were looking at were 43 men, and you're a man if you're 14, so the youngest person there was 14, in two rooms. They'd, they'd got into the corners of the room because if somebody comes into your room with a gun, you try to get as far away from them as possible. So everybody had huddled together in the oh. corner. And of course, as they died and fallen, what you have is um, you have the bodies lying on top of each other. And after nine months and 30 odd degree heat, the decomposition is extensive. And of course, they were also partly bur um, burnt. And because the building had been torched, the, the roof had come down, so they were partly buried under roof tiles as well. And the, the refugees, when they left, fleed the country, didn't take their dogs with them. So the dogs were roaming around like wild packs. And of course, mm. this was a food source for them. Oh, so no. for us, it was these badly decomposed, partly dismembered, um, partly burnt and partly buried bodies. That was the first thing that we saw. And our job was to try and, and sort them out, try to find out how many people were here. Were they men or women? How old were they? How did they die? And, you know, it gone, gone as the image of having a nice CSI type mortuary with, you know, shiny stainless steel. Yeah. There is no mortuary. There is no running water. There is no electricity. You're doing the post-mortems on top of a plank of wood out in the open air, but you're having to do it at the same level of forensic um, yeah. attention to detail as would be expected of you if you were in the best facilities in the world. 
what sort of things give away uh, who these people are? Are you able to actually identify the person? So the first thing that happens is that when, when you have an indictment site like that, it becomes much stronger evidentially if there is a survivor. And there was one survivor. He had got been in the corner of the room and everybody in front of him had taken the bullets. He'd survived. And he had to lie underneath the dead bodies of his family <sighs> and his colleagues whilst they burnt on top of him. And he was very badly burnt, but he survived. Oh now, that God. meant that what we had was a witness. And the witness, therefore, had a test testimony who said this is what happened these are who the people were our job as the forensic team is to go in without that knowledge but to say what do we have here what's the evidence here are these men are they women are they children are they old people have we got evidence of gunfire and if our forensic evidence matches the witness statement, then when you get to court, what you have is a really strong set of, of evidence that you can put um, in terms of the prosecution. But mm. our job is, first of all, to try to separate these bodies. Mm. So, you know, as you decompose, little bits will filter down from one down to the other. And so it becomes oh a God. bit like a three-dimensional human jigsaw. And you need to try and take one person out at a time and say, well, this is male. This is a male who's young, probably between 14 and 16. Who do we know is missing? Because people will come forward and say, these are the people who were on that, that refugee train. And we can then trace their family members, existing family members. We can take DNA samples from their family. We can take DNA samples from the bodies and we can see if they match. And that's how we'll eventually get down to a name, hopefully. And this is presumably important for both the prosecution for sort of war crimes and also for the families of the deceased. Absolutely. So, so we're working at two levels, but in reality, we can only work at one. Our job is there as experts for the court. We can't be influenced by what family say has happened. We can't be influenced by the fact that they desperately want to have this body back. Mm. We have to be able to say, this is, this is the evidence we found. This is what we recovered. This is what we analysed from it. And here is my report and my opinion on it. The other side of that is once you do have a name, there's a huge feeling that you've completed a circle because you know that you can give that body back to families. That giving back of a body is really important psychologically for a family to know that that is dad or son or whatever it may be. But it's also got a really important social and financial implication for some families because if they can prove that the head of the family who was the breadwinner has been murdered, then they can apply for funding um, that will help them to keep their family alive. So it, it has you know, so many different benefits on so many different levels. Wow, that is fascinating. How did you process that? Did you come out of there, as you were alluding to, a different person to the one who went into Kosovo? Totally, totally different person. But what you have to do is not to be influenced by the politics and not to be influenced by the horror of what you see. Our job is not to find somebody guilty. That's not our job at all. And our job is not to be influenced by any government that, that is looking for a particular outcome. So we try very hard to sort of lock out the peripheral richness of information around a situation and become very, very myopic. And if you can do that and focus down on your job and what it is that you need to do, I think you've got a better survival mechanism as well for yourself. But what I did learn, because normally in, in those sorts of situations, the family and the forensic experts don't get to meet each other. Normally we're in a mortuary and it's clinical and there's separation. But when you're recovering bodies in the field, you have family around you. And that for us is always the difficult time because at that point you get to know people and you get to form a relationship with them. And that's, I think, at times where the difficulty becomes uh, comes into play because the human part of you, you're trying desperately to suppress as the scientist, but unfortunately, you know, we, we are all human in nature. And I learned that the problems that and the worries that people have around the world are the same things. People worry about their security, they worry about their health, they worry about their children. Um, and I learned when I came back to the UK that I didn't care anymore 
whether there was a scratch on my car or whether the hoovering needed to be done. But I did care that every single night I told my children I loved them. And every single night they got a story before they went to sleep. And every single night they had hugs and kisses because there were families that we met that would never, ever be able to do that again. Mm. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think I took back into my personal life. It's very hard for me to imagine doing what you do because I think I've personally, I have quite a sensitive sense of revulsion um we've got larvae moth things at the moment worms and i i get i get freaked out looking at them and then you're talking about you go and see a you know a 3d mesh of bodies i mean do they do those images come back and haunt you or is or do you get desensitized well i think i think it's a little bit of both so i think i have had um a long career in some ways of desensitization Mm. um my father was a great shot And I loved my father and my father would go out shooting. So I went out with him from a very young age, shooting rabbits and deer and pigeons and such things. And my mother was a bit squeamish. So I would sit with my father at the back door and pluck them and gut them and skin them. So from six or seven years of age, the working with dead animals um, seemed quite normal to me because it meant that I could go and spend time with my dad. And when I was a teenager, when all my friends were working in fashion stores and cosmetic counters and things, I got a job in a butcher shop. And so I spent the entirety of my teenage (laughs) years up to my elbows and blood and muscle and bone, and it felt perfectly normal. So when Mm -hmm. I went to university, it felt like the next logical step to go into the anatomy department because it was very similar to the butcher shop. It was just a different animal. From the anatomy department, it was the next step into a mortuary. And so Mm. in many ways, that sort of general step by step, I think has been enormously helpful. But I'm not so, um, you know, I'm I'm not so stupid to think that it will never affect me because I've seen some of my colleagues who I would never have anticipated it would have affected. And if you haven't read the book by Richard Shepard called Mm. Unnatural Causes, he explains there as a pathologist so beautifully how he never thought, you know, quite aggressively, you know, I'm a pathologist, this is never going to bother me. And he did, he had that moment of downward spiral where PTSD kicked in. So I think he was very brave and he told all of us that, you know, it can come your way too, but it hasn't yet. Wow, there's so much stuff that you've seen that that most people haven't ever seen. But isn't that isn't that good? Isn't it good that other people don't have to see it? Because if there are the equivalent of the sin eaters for the world, let them do those jobs so that other people oh, don't yeah. have to. It reminds me a little bit of that Jack Nicholson line in A Few Good Men when he says you can't handle the truth and he talks about how we can all go to sleep at night um, and just sort of either criticize not that anybody would criticize you and you know uh but but they would criticize soldiers and things uh but meanwhile we're so lucky that we have those people because i i'm walking around my flat trying to avoid larvae worms you know asking my girlfriend to come and get rid of them but it also raises an interesting thing about disgust because i thought disgust was uh, or revulsion in, in a person was natural and it came from evolution because it makes sense to be a bit squeamish around certain things but I remember reading recently that it's actually a learned characteristic so it's really interesting that obviously working like that as a child you didn't you just didn't no no not at all and so you know if hmm. I have a, a boiling mass of maggots in front of me my automatic thought is, oh, if my hands are cold, I can put them in the middle and they'll be warm. <gasps> I don't find any revulsion in that at all. Would you eat one? Would I eat one? No, why would you? What if it was cooked? If, if I was starving and I had nothing else, then I would have yeah. no trouble at all. Yeah. Absolutely none. Eat, it would probably taste like a bit, if you've run out of rice and you've got enough for like one helping, but you want a bit more and there's Possibly. some maggots. But you see, my problem is, and this is where your, your mm. point about it being learned behavior is so important. My Achilles heel that I simply cannot cope with are rodents. So hamsters oh, yeah. and gerbils and mice and rats are just absolutely paranoid about them and there is nothing could persuade me to pick up a dead mouse nothing so my children never got hamsters or gerbils or anything like that that was just never going to happen i wonder why do you know why that is i wonder if 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 when you were working in in the butcher you know a, a, a rat or a mouse could have spoiled the food and stuff 
No, so when I was, I must have been about eight mm. or nine, and my parents ran a hotel on the west coast of Scotland, and it was mm. the year when the dustmen, or scaffies as we'd call them, the dustmen, um, went on strike. So what we had oh. around the back of the hotel was lots of waste piling up, and I was walking around the back with my father, and I can remember him saying to me, can you hand me that brush? And I handed my father a brush, and he had a rat in the corner. And to me as a child, the rat was about this size. And if I close my eyes, I can see its tail lashing. Mm. I can see its red eyes and I can hear it growling. Mm. And my father says it never happened, or he did when he was alive. It never happened. It blooming well did <laughs> because I remember it. And so from that point forward, rodents of any kind or any size is just mm. such a no. That's that's my complete and utter disgust and revulsion. Wow. But in Kosovo, um, for example, at, at a place called Podievo Meat Market, what they had learned to do was to try to put the forensic teams off track. And so you'd get mass burials, and then on top of it, they would bury a dead horse or a dead cow. So that if you smelt decomposing and you dug down, what you'd find as a horse or a cow and you'd stop. And all of our, our military who were with us knew that I had this, this ridiculous fear of rodents. And as they dug down and they hit this liquid horse, I went to move forward and they said, stay there. And what they'd done is they'd hit a rat's nest. And so all the rats disappeared off. And then once they'd cleared off, what they said to me was, now you can get into the hole with the liquid horse. Oh. Enjoy the horse. The rats are gone. The rats are oh gone. And word. the rats are gone. I have no trouble with that at all. Absolutely none. You also had no trouble with transporting human heads in designer bags uh, on a plane. Could you tell me about that? I had a lot of trouble trying to transport those heads. So this was in a, in a very different time. Um, you know, life has changed in terms of our transportation and what we're allowed to do these days. But um, uh, a gentleman in Verona... Um, was arrested by police and he was accused of, um, initially he was accused of sexual predator and uh, requesting that prostitutes undertake activities with him um, that were illegal. When they looked through some several thousand photographs that he had in his premises, they found one of a young lady and they believed that the damage to her could only have happened when she was dead. So that set off an investigation around the farm to say, are we going to find bodies? And they did find several bodies of young ladies who many of them had bags over their head and he'd obviously um, suffocated them and we suspect tied rope around their neck as well. We knew that most of these were probably prostitutes and prostitutes can have a very chaotic lifestyle and be very transient. So they may come into that job for a while and then move on. Mm. And so when they're no longer working in a particular area, people assume often that they've just moved on to something else. And when they go missing, nobody alerts the police to it. So we suspect that what we had were, were prostitutes. We knew that there were a couple of, of named uh, ladies who were missing. And the question that the, uh, the Italian police posed to us was, could um, either of these two women be in the bodies that we found? And I think they found about seven or eight bodies on, on his land. And there were two in particular that they believed could be them. Now, you've got to bear in mind, this is in the days when DNA was still in its infancy. So nowadays, what we do is we take a DNA sample from the, the remains. We'd go and yeah. check them with mum and dad or brothers and sisters, but we didn't have that. And one of the things that the police wanted to do was to try to superimpose photographs of the skull onto the photographs that we had of the missing women. Yeah. And that required us to have a particular photographic setup, which we had in Glasgow, but they didn't have in Verona. So it meant that the the two women's heads had to be transported from Verona to Glasgow. And what they decided they would do, the, the authorities, was that I would carry both heads as hand luggage. And to conceal it, the heads were placed each in sealed white plastic buckets, and then each bucket placed in a very 
expensive designer Italian firm, Carrier Bag, um, mm. which I won't name who it was. I had one letter in Italian, one letter in English to explain what I was carrying, that I had the authority to carry it and why we were doing it. But you can imagine the scenario when you, you, you rock up to the front of, of the airport and you go to go through security and yeah. they say, put your bags on, on, you know, the scanner. So you have to hand over the letter that says, here's what's in here. And they were so horrified yeah. by it, you know, that they just said, please go through. And that was my experience all the way from Verona to Glasgow was that nobody wanted to look, fortunately, I think, inside those bags and inside those buckets to see whether what I was carrying was what I really said it was. And it just turned into such a, a farce in many ways, but not something that would happen today. It was off its time. Did it even, were there even x-ray machines to go through? They said, so they were going to put it through the x-rays machines. And I said, look, please, please read the letter first. Because if you look up on the screen and what you see is a skull facing you, you know, that, that's a trauma for the person on the end of the screen. So I was very clear and very careful to every stage of the authority that they knew beforehand. And it was, it was almost as if I was contagious. They just moved me on swiftly. As I would do if I were working there. I would not want to look at that. I, yeah, if you wanted to smuggle anything, that would have been the time to do wouldn't it. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But, you know, we wouldn't do that these days. What a story. What was the reaction on the plane like? Um, so there were two planes. There was the first plane that took me from, from Verona to London. And the air hostess said, you know, sorry, madam, but you need to put your bags in the hold. And I said, no, I can't put my bags in the hold because this is continuity of evidence. Here's the letter. And she, she read the letter, I was clearly horrified. And she moved me down to business class, which I thought was, was actually rather nice. But she moved me down to business class and isolated me as if I had barbed wire around me and ignored yeah. me for the entirety of the flight and when I got onto the plane to go then from London to Glasgow I did exactly the same thing but this time I was isolated to the back of the plane and everybody else got moved up to business class so it's obviously a policy <laughs> isolate the forensic anthropologist who's carrying heads in a bucket yeah for whenever that happens it's a really difficult story to break down uh, probably for you as the teller of stories like that and for me uh, as the listener to them because they are sort of quite funny in that they're unique and eccentric and crazy and they're quite kick-ass for lack of a better word as, as Americans would say but at the same time of course you're, you're carrying two heads of real people Absolutely. so it's horrifying and horrible for their families for them and it is awful yeah you must have to get the tone right when you tell these stories to friends and family dinner parties and it's like you don't know where the tone should be and how people should react to them and th there are two tones there's the tone that says you know human life and human nature can be ridiculous and we all know that and there's a tremendous amount of black humor surrounds death but that black humor is never disrespectful to the person who's deceased mm -hmm. or to their families it's often disrespectful to yourself so you're telling you know the, the joke mm -hmm. on yourself or you're telling the story of the ridiculous confrontation and situations you had to go through. But nobody ever takes away from the fact that these are somebody's daughters who went through yeah. the most horrendous, I suspect, end of life. And the most important thing we could do was to get to Glasgow by whatever means it had to be to do the work to then go back to the court to give evidence in court so the jury could decide on the guilt or the innocence of this person. And mm. they found him unanimously guilty. So the, the fact that we have a, a, a crazy sort of pathway doesn't ever take away from the seriousness of the event that's occurred and the people who are involved and the justice mm. That needs to be done as well. They're still fantastic stories, aren't they? But, but there, there often are. You need to be able to cope. You know, you need to find a way to be able to rationalise what you're experiencing. And it's not normal, but sometimes it can be very, very funny. And that release of humour, providing it's never directed at the victim or the perpetrator or the families, can be the safety valve that allows you to do the difficult job sometimes that you need to do. Some of the funniest places I've been in the world are in mortuaries, just simply because it's the way to cope with the enormity of the unusual circumstances that you're experiencing.
I don't know if this is a confirmation bias of mine, but why do I feel like there's something distinctly British about that kind of being able to laugh at death? I don't think it's it's distinctly British. I think when you look at humour, there is a huge amount of humour globally associated with, with death. I mean, Halloween is, is a time that, that it focuses on death and has a huge amount of humour. The Day of the Dead um, isn't about humour, but there's a huge amount of love and there's a huge amount of festivities and talking and laughter and reminiscence. I think what has happened in many ways is that we've fallen out of love with death. And what I mean about that is if you go back to Victorian times, um, there was nothing better than a good death and a good funeral and a good send off because it gave you a tremendous amount of pomp and ceremony. Because the one thing that's certain is that death is going to happen. It, it, it's not a maybe it will happen, it will happen. And so we have to have a mechanism of being able to cope with the inevitability. Now, the Victorians did it with pomp and ceremony. And I think since then, what we've done is we've made death much more clinical so that when a family member dies, we don't lay them out in our front room anymore for people to come round and say goodbye to them and hold their hand and kiss them. What we do is the body goes away into the funeral directors and you'll probably never see it again because in many in many cultures we don't do open caskets mm. and so there is a mystery that surrounds the dead body for our generations and that mystery when you don't see it we tend to build a culture around it and i think it's it's become a culture of a bit of, of fear and a little bit of um you know, let, let's not encourage it because mm. it might just encourage death to come a little bit too close. So let's deal with it stoically yeah. rather than thinking of it as being something that is as natural as a child being born. It is mm. as natural that you will die as well. It's funny you say that we can't avoid it because I did have three weeks ago on this podcast, uh, Dr. Andrew Steele, who's a biologist who um, just wrote a book about how we can live forever. And he very much intends to live forever. So he would, he would take issue with your statement. Why would you want to, first of all? Why mm. would you want to live forever? And when you look at the normal human aging process, there is a very good reason for, for why we get old and why we no longer reproduce in that, that advanced age and why ultimately the purpose of most animals ceases and we die. It is to me a natural process. You start to tinker with those natural processes and you have to ask why. Mm. If you're going to let people live forever, then you're gonna to have to have to stop having babies because we can't get to a mm. point where we have a population on the planet that just keeps growing exponentially. Yeah, well, he had an answer for, for everything. Tell, tell me, so so, how did you move from that to so stopping paedophiles and that kind of work? So um, when I was in Kosovo, um, one of the officers that was out there with me from the Metropolitan Police got in touch with me and said, look, we've got a case and we don't quite know what to do with it. And I thought I'd phone you and ask you. And what they had was a case of a young girl who alleged that her father came into her room at night and he sexually abused her. And she told her mother and her mother didn't believe her. What she then did, I think, after that was just an, an incredible thing. She left her Skype camera on. And if you leave your camera from your computer on at night, it clicks into near infrared mode, which means you can see in the dark. And so if you know, you know these um, programs on television where people go ghost hunting and you see on the screen what they have are these sort of black and white images, that's because it's infrared light. The eyes go yellow. Yeah, that's right. And, and you, you can see, you can actually see the veins on people's faces or on their hands huh. because the infrared light reacts with the deoxygenated blood and veins and you can see the vein pattern. So when she left this camera on, what we saw at half past four in the morning was a hand and a forearm coming into view of the camera and doing exactly what she said was happening to her. But what we could see was this incredible vein pattern on the back of the hand on the back of the forearm. 
And they asked if we could do anything with it. And I said, well, all I can tell you is, from my background in anatomy, since Vesalius in the 1500s, what we've known as the veins and the hand are incredibly variable. And there's some work done by a Professor Tomasia from Padua back in the 1960s that suggested that everybody's vein patterns, the further away they are from the heart, they're probably unique. And I said, so I can look at the vein pattern you can see on the camera and I can compare it with dad's vein pattern. Now, if they're different, I'm confident to say it's not the same person. But if they're the same, I haven't done the research to tell you what the likelihood is of anybody else having the same vein pattern. But what I can tell you is that your right side is not a mirror image of your left. And if you doubt me, look at the veins on the back of your right hand and the veins on the back of your left hand, they will be a different pattern. Don't have any veins. They won't be the same. Don't have any. And if you can't see it because of your skin, look at the vein patterns, the blue veins on the inside of your wrist. Just, oh, I could see them. Yeah. I think also because I've got like a light behind this camera. So my eyes are on that light and then I'm looking at it just... Probably can't see it. When when you're in better light, have a look. Your vein patterns are different, right and left panicking now that I don't have any veins. <laughs> you you I think do I've got, have veins. I, I must promise. have some. Can you see my... Uh, it's too bright, isn't it? That, no, because oh. that, 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 that again goes too light. Oh, is it changing? Is that... Oh, oh but you've got a great um, um, set of marks on your hands, though, so I'd, I'd really have great fun oh. identifying you. What would you say about my hands? So there's your vein. So I can see your vein pattern, and I can also see... Um, the pattern of skin creases that you have across your knuckles on your fingers. Okay. And I can also see where you have little nests of melanocytes, cells that give you little patches of dark, <laughs> um, little dark pigment patches on your hand as well. Okay. Now, if you look at the patterns of skin creases, for example, over your mm. fingers, mm. they'll be different on each of those fingers and they'll be different mm. in your right hand and your left. Okay. So we knew all of this, but we wow. didn't know to what extent. And when we compared the images from the camera with dad, they matched perfectly. So I couldn't exclude dad, but I couldn't say with certainty it was him. So we went to court and the judge decided that he would allow the evidence to be heard because of um, my background in anatomy and the fact that anatomy over the last four or 500 years has shown that veins are variable. And so I gave evidence and the jury went away and came back and they found dad not guilty. Mm. And I didn't understand who then could be in her room at half past four in the morning doing what she said was happening to her that had the same vein patterns and they were saying he oh was not God. guilty. So I asked the barrister, what did we do wrong? And she said something to me that stayed with me then from that point forward. And she said, I don't think you did anything wrong. I don't think they believed the girl because she didn't cry. She didn't break down. And I thought, that's a really worrying thing about justice. Yeah. And so at that point, I said, well, we're going to do the research. And that's when we started doing the research back in, in 2006, it was. That reminds me a little bit of the Amanda Knox story, because we were all so certain she did it because she was reacting. She was acting a bit, not how you might expect. She was kissing her boyfriend or something at the murder scene and stuff like that. But it just seems ridiculous. Does it make you, does it make you lose trust in the jury system? Is that, is that outdated? No, because I think the, ju the jury system itself really does have a place. I mean, it, it's based in our history. It goes right back to the Magna Carta, to the, the right to have your peers judge your guilt or your innocence. Um, I'm not sure that every, every jury member necessarily gets it. Um, and certainly some people who I've spoken to have been on juries have been terrified at the level of, of ignorance in some ways and trying to understand the evidence that is put before them and the sort of temptation to make up your mind right at the outset and not change it. But then by the same token, you will have juries that will deliberate with great focus and great attention. You can't control that. But what you can control is how you relay the evidence in the court so that mm. you can make it understandable for everyone and you can place it into a context that they can understand the weight of that evidence. And that's what we weren't able to do in that case because we hadn't done the research. So I right. don't blame the jury. 
I blame the fact that we hadn't got enough research done at that point. And what happened to the girl, I I don't know. I suspect, you know, she, her father will have been released back into the family home um, where he'd been accused of something that she said he'd done. Um, I don't know if she's still alive, frankly, but part of my legacy is her legacy insofar as we would not have done the research we've done, we'd not have helped with all of the cases that we have if it hadn't been for her. And so we might not have been able to help her in that case, but her being brave enough to come forward has set up an entire multi-million research sets of projects that have helped the police in the UK secure at least 33 life sentences for paedophiles and probably close to 400 years of prison sentencing that wouldn't have happened without her bravery. That's amazing. And you'd like to think that even if the jury didn't say it was enough to prove beyond doubt that maybe the mother or somebody else involved in this girl's life would have, you know, it would have sown a seed of doubt in in their minds, at least. You would hope. But the the point is, we, we lose the contact at that stage with the case and with the family. So we have no way of knowing what happened Mm. beyond there. You then worked on Operation Orr, which implicated quite famous people. Like, um, the, I don't know if I should say them actually, because that's sort of being titillating and, you know. No, I, and, and I, had a, I had a peripheral roar, a role in Operation mm. Or. It really okay. was about um, just looking at images and deciding what could or couldn't be done with the images. So I had a limited amount of involvement in that, mm. uh, in that case. But what happened after the young girl's case was that others started coming forward. And those individual cases we were able to help with from that point forward. Mm. And we helped, we helped to bring... Um, We helped to close down one of the largest paedophile rings that Scotland had at Mm. the time in relation to one particularly horrendous image um, that we'd not have been able to do if the research hadn't been done. This was Neil Strachan, wasn't it? That's right. And you were saying that some of the men were abusing their friends' children. They, as far as I remember in that case, Neil Strachan, who was charged with it, it was either, if it wasn't a relative, it was a friend's child. And and that's the thing that I think we often, we fear the people we don't know, the stranger as being somebody to be aware of. Hmm. And in many ways, most crimes that we see, certainly in relation to child sexual abuse, they're caused by people who have normal access to that child, whether it's as a parent or as a partner of a parent or as somebody who babysits or somebody who looks after the children for a certain amount of time. It's, it's rare rarer, I should say, for it to be abuse by a stranger. It's more Mm. likely to be abuse by somebody that's known to the child. As an adult of young children or young teens, um, what do you do? Because you've you've got friends you trust more than anything in the world, but so did these people. They had friends they trusted that much. What what can you do? You have to, you know, there there will be times where you're going out and you've got your mate and can you look after the kids for a few hours? It's a balance, isn't it? And like, like all life's decisions are risks. And, you know, you yeah. think you know somebody, but but you don't. And what you can't do is I don't think you can live your life worried about the fear of every decision you make. You make the decision for the right reasons. Yeah. And 99.99% of the time, you've made the right decision. It's only every now and again and rare occasions where that decision you made is wrong and there is a consequence of it. And it, it is that age-old thing, you know, when... A hundred people say you're pretty and one person says you're ugly. You only hear one voice and the hundred other voices are drowned out. We can't make decisions being worried about what might happen. We can only make the best decisions available to us at that time. (sighs) Yeah, I'd never forgive myself though. That's the thing. And I guess people probably don't. And that's what parents say, if only Mm. I'd not done, if only. And that's Mm. that's the guilt that as a parent you bring back onto yourself. Mm. How how is it for you working with these people? Because obviously you have to be professional, but then you're dealing with people like Neil Strachan, like there's another one, Richard Huckle, that you uh, worked on his case. You must feel, uh, do you feel anger towards them? Or are you, again, desensitized after years of working? I don't feel anger. I don't understand it. 
is the honest mm. truth. I, I genuinely don't understand the abuse of children. Um, I'm, I'm of the view that the vulnerable, whether they be children or elderly, are there for us to protect. So I don't understand mm -hmm. their crime and I don't want to understand their crime. But I don't have to deal with them. All I deal with are the images, the images that they've produced and then the images that the police produce. And my job is to compare them. My job is not to find anybody guilty or innocent. It's to compare the images. It's right back to the same principle in Kosovo. I can't have an opinion on why somebody does something. I can't afford to be repulsed by what they do because my job is to compare these two sets of images and as a scientist, give my opinion on the likelihood or otherwise that they come from the same individual. And having to go through hours, I mean, I think with the Richard Huckle case, it was four days with your team of looking through the most horrific abuse to find the right moments and things. Is it similar to what you were saying about Kosovo in that you, you just, you're okay, you can just get on with it? Or do those images stay with you at night, for example, trying to get to sleep? There's a colleague of mine that works with me on these images. And I think what's really healthy is that somewhere down the line, we will say, oh, I've just been asked about this case. And both of us will go, I can't remember what those images are. And, and so in many ways, I think that's really healthy, that what we're doing is we know, we know what we're looking at. We know the, the fear, the horror, the anxiety that must go on in the victims of this. I don't understand the minds of the perpetrators, but I can't expose myself to those personally because that's not my job. My job is to look at these truly awful images, to desensitize myself to them, to be able to do the job. In terms of the minds of the perpetrators, I've been looking into some stories myself here about paedophilia because I've been looking to work on something with the BBC. They happen to have uh, in Berlin, uh, one of the only clinics in the world where paedophiles will never be reported to authorities when they go to therapy, no matter what. Uh, the therapists don't even have their names, their real names. They can't report them if they wanted to. So that's what I was, I've been working on and I've been writing about it. What they all seem to be saying, the therapists at these places, is that the vast majority of paedophiles never offend and the vast majority of offenders are more like psychopaths. So they don't, it could be an adult, it could be a child, they're not really bothered. It's just the easy access to a child compared to an adult. Does that ring true to you at all? Gosh, I don't know. Um, I, I, what I want to know is I want, I want to find out what you go and learn um, because I don't think I know. I think that's the kind of situation where you are more of an expert or will be in yeah. this than I am. I have personal views but it's not appropriate for me to convey personal views as, as a scientist. Because I'm a journalist, it means I can speculate as much as I want and just Absolutely. talk utter, utter nonsense, totally anecdotal, no, no empirical data. And empirical data is so hard <laughs> to come by for this kind of thing anyway. Um, but yeah, that seems to be what the, what's the, the consensus is, that it's mostly uh, psychos. You know what's really interesting, actually? Um, so I've been dealing with all these people, and I'm even in a community, an online community, in a forum, and I told them I'm a journalist, blah, blah, blah. I'm always very open with them about this non-offending paedophiles and that's that's the idea recently you know madeline mccann there was news that her abductor had been found and he was a german guy so i thought oh i could have the first sort of you know i know these people i'm going to get in there i've, I've got a german group of non-offending paedophiles so I, I put a message on their message board and i just said hey it's me the journalist again um, i'm just wondering does anybody know the paedophile who took madeline mccann I've been doing this for two years, speaking to these people, and they're very tetchy, like any kind of subculture. They're very tetchy if you say the wrong thing. And I had said a wrong thing. I had made a faux pas. And I, they went berserk, basically. And there were like 100 messages un under mine, just going, who the hell is this guy? Who let him in here? We shouldn't talk to him anymore. They, they shut down for months till I could get access to any of them again. I thought the mistake I made at first, trying to understand it, sifting through all this German message stuff, was that I had asked if they knew him because why would they know somebody who's an offender? The mistake I made was that I had referred to him as a paedophile. And they were saying, this guy had attacked adult women, he'd attacked other people. To them, they're proud of being paedophiles. This is the crazy thing. So for them, that was the, the biggest slur I could possibly say, that a disgusting man who had done such a thing to a child, when they love children, they say they wouldn't do that kind of thing. I understand. 
Yeah. It was so so weird to get my head around that 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 was the mistake I made. But you got your head around it to understand it, and you'd never do that again. I wouldn't make that mistake again. Although it comes out when you're talking to them by accident, and you you know you're so used to describing that, and it's it's a very complicated thing. What they teach, by just quickly in the therapy, in case you're interested, uh, it basically teach them mostly about the three risk factors. It's it's quite basic stuff. It's just like three main risk factors. One of them is uh, alcohol, of course. One of them is being around children, and it's amazing the cognitive biases of some of the people I've been speaking to because they say it actually helps me to be around children. It stops me offending, and I say, "What? Well, that doesn't make sense because if you're not around them, then you can't offend them." And they say, "No, you just don't understand." And the third one is stigma stigmatization. That's the third risk factor. So if they feel stigmatized and stuff like that, so it doesn't help because people keep graffitiing hang the paedophiles outside of their clinic and stuff like that and it only makes them more likely to offend fascinating absolutely fascinating uh, it's a very alien world and yet it's uh, one or two percent of men and i think what surprises some people is the number of women who are involved in these sort of processes as well and mm-hmm. you know for a variety of reasons they're involved sometimes it's so that they can gain access to the children to take the photographs because women are trusted more than men are. It might be that's, you know, for the sake of their partners or whatever it may be. So the woman may be a vehicle towards um, the activity, but it surprises a number of people how many women are involved. Yeah, I I think they tend to be sort of uh, enablers and things rather than paedophiles themselves, or maybe psychopaths they could be as well. I did meet a, I mean, it's very hard to find them. And even the head of the clinic in Berlin, who's a big deal in that whole world, when I told him I'd met one through years of trying to find all these people, he was shocked because he said like so, so few, he's had tens of thousands mm-hmm. of men coming to therapy in, in, in the last 10, 20 years. And in that time, maybe nine were women. And even among them, because there's another interesting thing is that a lot of people who go to that clinic they have to test them to see if they're real paedophiles because a lot of people who've got obsessive compulsive disorder or hypochondria think that they might be one and they panic and go to the therapy. So okay. quite a few women have done that. Fascinating. Crazy world. But isn't it the wonderful thing about human nature, you know, that, that there is so much variation in the world and if the variation was all good rather than having so much variation that's also yeah. bad, you know, it is, it is something to be celebrated that we're all different and that, you know, what's a cultural norm for one group is alien to another. That of itself, if you can abstract away from it, the harm that's done and the damage that's done, just, you know, Mm. celebrating just the enormity and the range of what a human can feel in their own head and mind as normal. To me, it's, you know, the human is just the most amazing piece of engineering mm. i suppose that's where our jobs overlap don't they as anthropologists and a journalist we're both really really interested in why people believe things why people behave in certain ways i'm fascinated by that as well and i i, I couldn't agree more with what you've just said i think it's important to have people who have ideas we would consider morally bankrupt um and to think but they they think they're good you know uh I, I've said this before on a podcast, but like if you know if Hitler went to bed, he didn't go to bed every night laughing maniacally, like ha ha ha, look what I'm doing. He went to bed going, yes, I'm doing what is right for the people. So it's amazing to think how somebody could get into that mindset where something so abhorrent to us, like paedophilia or Nazism, could could possibly seem right to them, and it can make us have to look at ourselves a bit as well. But isn't it also interesting just how many of us want to conform? We want to be the same as everybody else, Mm -hmm. whereas in fact, it should almost be the opposite. The individuality of each human is the thing that should be celebrated. But there is such a culture of everybody wanting to look like the Hollywood star or the the model or whatever it may be, that trying to conform in terms of appearance and thought. Mm -hmm is also interesting because it isn't saying it's saying that every now and again you get the one individual um like hitler you suggested who is very different out there on a limb but around that kind of individual are people who are doing the opposite rather than being different they're conforming to be the same no. almost underneath somebody who is very different Human humans are wonderful things, absolutely <laughs> wonderful things. Living in Germany, I just the history is all around you, particularly in Berlin, because of course there's the Nazis, which shows what happens when a right wing lunatic takes charge of a, of a country that was already heading that way, I suppose. And then of course the Stasi and all of that kind of thing as well, the left wing version of it, which was just again just people following. 
And I do feel, and I don't want to offend any Berliners listening. I don't know how many there are, but I do feel there's definitely that that sense of watching their neighbour to make sure that everybody's complying with the right rules. That that hangover from the 70s, um, 80s, 60s, whatever, uh, is still there. I feel my neighbours watching me. I feel the look burning into the back of my neck if I cross the road when it's still a red light, even if there's no car in sight. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if that's ever going to leave, or how long it will take for that to leave the the culture, and then it will come back again in another form. It will, and haven't we got it now with COVID? Um, you know, where where mm. people are reporting on other people because, you know, they've got four people in their garden having a party. Do you know, it's it's human nature. There's no more human feeling than I suppose. There's two of them, and again, going back to Germany, the Schadenfreude is one of them. But then what you described of just like somebody else is contravening rules that I'm obeying. There's nothing that makes us angry. All of us, I go mad. Yeah. The societal police force of one. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself doing it in a shop, for example, if I'm waiting in a queue. If they said to me, excuse me, like, sorry, you're going to have to wait 10 minutes longer. I, no problem. Fine. If somebody cut in the line and I had to wait 30 seconds longer, I wouldn't forget that for days. I'd be livid about that. But that's because you're British and British know how to queue. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a strict, strict routine and <laughs> regime around queuing. Yeah. And an etiquette that is just not to be abused. <laughs> I know, but maybe we need to get like let that go away a little bit because that go. whole obeying rules is not good. And I, I do feel nowadays, and this is happening a little bit more on the left. I won't go overly political. Well, both sides actually of the spectrum of just it's it's become now it's cool to follow rules in a way that maybe James Dean back in the day or even Brad Pitt in the 90s were like these cool guy Nirvana that was cool it's not cool nowadays and I worry about that that it's cool and people are now looking up to the ones who follow rules and that can always be a little bit dangerous but it'll change again it's like flared trousers if you wait long enough they'll come back in fashion and so whatever whatever the sort of trending nature is today, yeah. give it a decade, it'll change. Are flare trousers not in fashion? I'm sure they are again. If you're wearing them, I'm sure they are. No, I don't even know what they are. I think they have big things at the bottom. I've got the say, I've got like two t-shirts and a pair of, I don't know anything about fashion. What's next for you? So what about my own death? Oh, well, hopefully that, that doesn't coincide with what's next for you. Well, um, it, it will eventually. Eventually it will be next and then it will be before. Yeah. So it's going to come. And Mm. I'm a great believer that you have to be um, comfortable with the fact that, you know, your time on earth is limited. And my grandmother came from the west coast of Scotland. She believed that death was with you every single day and walked alongside you. Mm. And um, if she believed that if, if death was going to walk beside her, then she needed to make it her friend. And in the 1800s, it would have been improper for her to have a male friend. So death for her was always female. And so death for me has always been she. And something about death being a she is a little bit less threatening, I think, than death being a he. Mm. Because we think about the yeah. Grim Reaper and the, you know, the sort of black hooded cloaks and such things. And that's a classic Victorian scaring the children stuff. But death for me is something that is inevitable. And it's the last great adventure because you're only going to experience it once. You can't rehearse it. And so I want to be able to experience it. I want to know what it feels like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, what it looks like. Um, I won't remember it because then it'll be done. But I I want to be able to experience it because I spent so much of my time around death. And with my father, I was with my father when he took his last breath. And so it has no fear for me. But I've also got this sort of um, classic Scottish Presbyterianism that says you need to tidy things up at the end. And so bodies, bodies are inconvenient things that get left behind when you die. So I think it's my responsibility to make sure that I deal with that as well. And so what I've done is donated my body to my own department. So I I expect to be dissected when I die. I want it to be in my old department because of the the type of embalming that they do, which means that it's much more realistic. The tissues are quite soft. And I want to be dissected by science students, not by medics or dentists, because medics and dentists just don't have enough time to do it in detail. 
And I want the science students to be able to take apart every single bit of my body. So I want them to find every muscle and blood vessel and nerve and, and use it to the point that when they're finished, you know, it's not recognisable. And then what I want them to do is to gather together all the muscle and fat and skin and all those sort of soft tissue things. And they can cremate that. So that can go up and smoke. There'll be nothing left. But I want them to gather the bones together. And because there's fat inside your bones, I know I'm going to have to be boiled. So they're going to have to boil the bones to get the fat out of them. But then I want them to string me as a skeleton. And then I can hang in my own dissecting room and teach for the rest of my death which I think is is the most appropriate thing for a teacher and an anatomist is to keep working after you've died. Isn't that just a perfect circle? I feel a bit sick. Oh, no. Well, see, my daughters, my daughters are wonderfully um, open minded about it because they've grown up in in this kind of, you know, a family where where death for us is a a normal thing. And it was my youngest daughter, who's a lawyer now, who said, yeah, yeah, mum, she said, you know, there's something in that because when your parents die, you know, either you're cremated and the ashes are scattered or you're buried and you go and visit a bit of a cemetery. Mm. She said, but actually, if you're in a box in the anatomy department, we could come and visit you. And I thought they could. And how different is that to the Mexican Day of the Dead? It isn't. It's about visiting the loved people, the people that you loved. It's about spending time with them. It's about talking and remembering. And the fact that their physical remains are there as well I think is just that that wonderful connection that that exists beyond generations. So yeah, we're slightly unusual. I think you've touched upon a, di- a key difference now between anthropologists and journalists because I think for you it is just the ex- it's the experience. You just want to have that experience no matter yeah. what. And for me, I want to have it and then experience writing and about it and showing off about it. (laughs) See, that's not going to happen. So I have accepted that I will experience it and then immediately forget and not know. Don't go anywhere. I've picked an episode specifically for you after Sue Black. She's just the maddest guest ever. And if you enjoyed that, you're probably going to like this one with H.G. Tudor, who's a narcissistic psychopath. People really like that one. So click here, keep watching.